Okay. Um, so we're doing a story on military uh, service and uh, military heroes. Um, I guess your son uh, had mentioned that, uh, had told us that um, um, you uh, were quite the hero um, in Europe. And so um, I guess if I could just start, um, you told me that your dad had um, uh, told you some stories of, of his service. What, um, what types of stories uh, did he tell you? Well, he was telling me a story about one particular mission that he flew where he got shot up pretty bad. And uh, I'd, I'd never heard that story till last Thursday. It obviously affected you uh, quite a bit. It was um, rather intense, and uh, I got a copy of the letter from his squadron that detailed what happened. What, are, what were some of the? What stuck out in your mind? Just being able to get back home. <laughs> I mean, he got shot up pretty bad. You want to tell the story? Well, I don't know which one you're talking about. Get to. The one you were telling me about the diamond down position was a good story. About the what? The diamond down. Oh, well, that big mission, that's a, a real story about that. It, uh, real amazing how things happen. It, uh, they came in and they said, uh, Kepler, we lost our diamond down man. And uh, that's a ship that flies in the middle of everybody else, right in, <laughs> right in the middle. And he, he said, uh, I know you've never flown that position before, but I think that uh, you're the only one that can do it. So I'd like you to do it. It's funny how things happen in life. But uh, so I flew in that position, which is you're, you're trapped in behind everybody. So you got in there. But, uh, we were going over the Alps. And uh, our lead ship blew up right in front of me. Just boom, like that. And uh, my only reaction was down, to get out of the way of all that stuff. And we were up above the clouds. And of course, uh, it wasn't but a second or two that I was in the clouds. And uh, started picking up ice right away. So I couldn't see anything anyway. And uh, so I, I tried to climb back up and uh, to get back up out of the clouds. And uh, they wasn't going to do it. And I called my bombardier and I said, you got to get rid of all these bombs. And he said, the bomb bay doors won't open, they're frozen. So uh, I said, drop them anyway, which he did. And of course, with the bomb bay doors open, all that air come up through there, what a big mess that was. And uh, tried to climb back up, and uh, of course, I couldn't see. I saw all over everything. So I was strictly flying instruments. And uh, so I called uh, my navigator, Paul Corkill, and I asked him, I said, Paul, have we got any chance at all of getting back to the, over the Alps, back, get back home, or do we have to go into uh, Nice and be interned for the rest of the war? And he, he said, I, I think we can do it if you can hold the altitude. 
And uh, <coughs> it, what a big mess that was. So he called me a couple times and he said, Kepler, you're off course. <laughs> I said, I'm having a hard time just flying this thing, let alone staying on this thing. Well, we couldn't bail out, because if you bail out over the Alps up there, you're going to go down into the snow. You're going to freeze anyway. And then, so, but he, he finally told me, he says, I think we're okay, Kepler. And uh, you can start letting on down. And uh, he kept giving me headings to go on. How he did that, I have no idea because he couldn't see anything either. And uh, so we were, we were down to about 5,000 feet. And uh, I asked one of the crew members back there, I said, what you, can you see water down there? And he said, yeah, <laughs> that was the Adriatic Sea. And uh, so, we're flying down there, and my nose gunner, why he decided he wanted to do that, I have no idea, but he crawled down to the front and got up into his nose turret. And he rotated the turret, which broke all the ice off of his thing, and that came back up and broke the windshields out. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden here I've got all this air coming in here. So, so, what a mess that was. So, but uh, finally the the ice started coming off and stuff. And I called back and talked to some of my crew members, and one of the crew members I called was he was crying. And here I am, 21 years old. <laughs> and I told this kid, I said, son, just hang in there. In a couple hours, we're going to be on the ground, and you'll get a nice little drink of bourbon that they give you when you, when you <laughs> land. And uh, so, but made it all the way back to the base, landed that airplane, and taxied up. And it's usually, uh, The girls from the USO were there coming up and they give you uh, something to drink right off the bat. <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, it was quite a mission. So, but as, as usual, I, I was never given any recognition for that, even though what I did, I think, was pretty big, but uh, because our lead ship got 10 people gone, and you know, he was, I forget what, uh, he was he was probably a colonel or a major, so, so I'm sure they were probably writing that up more than worrying about what I did. So, but uh, later on, in, uh, I met somebody uh, when I was back in the States. A guy came up and says, Kepler, you know you got the DFC for that mission. And I said, I've never heard of it. He said, yeah, you, you got it. But at that time, I was trying to get out of the Army, jumping from place to place. And uh, so I, I never got the medal. So, that, that was quite a story. So, also, um, telling that story, it sounds like um, it could have happened yesterday to you. I mean, you <laughs> had all the guys' names and details and everything. Is, is it? No, I can't. You know, I can remember, uh, you know, like I remember Paul Corkell, and I, I've always wanted to 
call him and get a hold of him and thank him. Now he he get he he his feet froze. You, I don't know if you knew what we were flying, but uh, it was uh, 30 degrees below zero most of the time. Uh, and we wore heated flying suits. And there was plugs from one suit into the boots. And if, if those got unplugged, uh, you had no idea whether the feeling that you had was cold or what. But he lost his uh, toes on that mission. So he got the purple heart. <laughs> From the, from the mission, so yeah, but that was quite a story. So, yeah. um, do you have any, any... Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, what's it like hearing your dad talk about? Uh... It's real emotional. It's um, it's just hard to imagine somebody being able to do that. At, at 21, but um, I, uh, like my my co-pilot was there, he he was just sitting there. He he wasn't doing anything, so I was just flying the whole thing all the way back. So. You think he was um, he couldn't handle it? He was in shock, or. Uh, he was probably in shock. Yeah. It, uh, it, to be so young, I mean, to be 21 and in a situation like that. Be what? To be to be that young as, as you guys were, and to be in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that would affect you for the rest of your life. I mean, you remember the story like it was yesterday. Hey, Pop. Yeah. Tell them about asking your CO how many missions it took before you could go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first got over there, you know, and you got all the things and stuff, uh, asking, you know, if you, if you fly 50 missions, you get to go home. And I asked, how long does it take to do that? He said, nobody's ever done it yet. <laughs> so. How many did you fly? Well, we had, uh, I flew 35 missions. But some of the missions that we flew, when they were long missions, uh, 14, 15 hours, you got credit for two. So. So I ended up with what to call a 50 mission thing, so. You should tell that Kepler you show up my airplane story really quick. You what? You should tell, all I remember is the punchline, but you should tell the Kepler you shot up my airplane mission story really quick. No. Your, your flight mechanic that asked you what happened to your airplane. Oh, my, well, not on this one. He, I'm sure he, uh, a good one. One mission when I came back and taxed it up on the hard stand, my ground crew chief came up and says, Kepler, what did you do to my airplane? <laughs> Full of bullet holes and flag was all shot up. So, um, it, uh, the coal was uh, the worst thing of the, the whole thing. It, uh, you know, your oxygen mask would, would drip and step down and you used to have a pile of ice on your belt buckle there. But if uh, I remember one time it leaned over so the thing would have to fall several feet and a drop would fall down there and it would freeze and bounce. <laughs> so yeah. that's how cold it was. So. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Sure. 
I got this uh, letter from before 49. Yeah. You don't have to read it. You can read it later. But it's about one of your missions. Pop. This is about 69 years late. Yeah, how in the world did you get that? <laughs> so, so, well, listen, you were 1796. Is this important in that letter? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that really something. Tell them. What you got there? Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. Got to thank Ray Park, too. You what? Ray Park. Yeah. Well, it's quite something. So. You're quite something. You are? You. You are quite something. Thank you, Danny. Yes. Well, I often wonder, looking back on that, that uh, there's two things that was either lucky or good. So, but I always thought I was good. So, <laughs> so, so. How does it make you feel to uh, have the distinguished flying cross? You, say again. How does it make you feel now that you've got your... Oh, it, it, well, they told, the guy told me that I got it, but I was on my way out of the, the army. So, he wanted to know how you feel now that you got it. Well, I think it. it's great that I got it. It makes me feel good. Well, we, it really seems like it was almost yesterday.